Hey everyone, this is Matt Wakeling and you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. This is the show that I produce in Sydney, Australia, where I speak to leading guitarists and guitar figures from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, in today's episode, I speak to the incredible Gil Paris from New York City, a New York cat born and bred and legendary amongst jazz, fusion, rock and blues circles. We had a great conversation talking about Gil's career as a solo artist and a sideman, talking about his signature model Reverend guitars and much, much more. Now before we jump in, uh, I want to give a big shout out to our friend Joe Elliott. Joe, you might remember from episode 40, a fantastic guitar player in his own right. And uh, he's hooked me up with quite a few people on the show. So Gil today, also the interview with Joel Hoekstra and Scott Henderson. Um, I was put into touch with those guys through Joe as well. So Joe, many, many thanks. And uh, you get a shout out at the start of the interview. So let's jump straight in to my conversation with Gil. Hey, Gil Paris, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining me. Now, first question um, has got to be Joe Elliott, who's a a great friend of this podcast um, and who hooked me up with you. How do you know Joe? He's he's an awesome guy. So uh, I did a show with with Greg Cock and um, and Bernie Williams at in St. Paul. And uh, that's his his sort of home locale. And uh, um, he came and sat in with us and he was a gracious host. And um, yeah, so uh, I've been friends with him a little while and he's a great guy. Very good. Now, you are born and bred in New York. How, how are you doing at the moment? Things are, uh, we're all in lockdown. How, how are you going with that? Yeah, I was born in New York. Yeah, I was born in the Bronx. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we, we have it tough, right? Well, everybody has it tough everywhere. But New York is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's sort of the, uh, the big center of everything. And, uh it's tough, you know. It's very, it's a bizarre times. And how are you keeping? So you're just locked, locked in, pretty much. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of went through some, some stuff for a couple, like three, four weeks back. So, um, yeah, I've kind of been locked down. I'm about half an hour from Midtown, so I'm a little bit away from the craziness. Okay. Yeah. You know. Um. So. Uh, and uh, luckily, living on delivery. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Tell me, Gil, when, when did you start playing guitar and what musical influences in, inspired that, that start for you? So I started playing when I was eight or nine. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I started out as like a record collector. I was kind of collecting records and... I'm I'm still a record collector, so I was a huge fan of music, and uh, and all kinds of music. For some reason, I just seemed to like everything. You know, it was just you know. <laughs> um, was it a musical I, family? Uh, well, my father was an actor, so I was a, definitely a showbiz family. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah uh, but they really encouraged me, and actually, my parents when I was I think it was thirteen or fourteen said, you know, you can't just play rock. We want you to, like, take jazz lessons and we want you to take classical lessons. And, like, they really, you know, they were tough. <laughs> but I'm so glad, you know. That's great. I mean, that reflects in your playing. You, you're an eclectic player. You're known for your jazz playing, but you infuse so much rock and, and blues and, and funk into that yeah. stuff as well. So you can, I, I get the sense I hear a lot of deep listening that's going on in your life. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I find that the most exciting stuff comes from crossing genres, you know, and uh, and of course the whole taste element. When you listen to a lot of records, you sort of get like a producer's ear. You begin to edit your playing. And, you know, if you've listened to like a lot of the studio guys, which I grew up listening to, you know, David Sanborn, Larry Carlton, Cornell Dupree, you know, um, all the greats. Uh, Michael Brecker, you know, it's there was a certain editing they had in their playing that, uh, you know, I like to take with me. You're you're known for your your phrasing, your your 
listening to your latest solo album, there's a track on there, just one example, Back to Blue, and there's so many lines on that song. I think, man, that does not sound like a, a, a cut-out guitar lick from, uh, right. from insert blues rock artist here, it's, uh, which is not, no new discovery by me. You're known for that. But what sort of non-guitar influences have you infused? Oh, my God. I mean, so, you know, one of the things that always kind of irked me was because I, I was never a huge guitar fan. I guess maybe when I was first starting out, I was. But I kind of feel like with a lot of guitarists, you can tell what five records they listen to. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like you can kind of tell what they're coming out of. And But for me, I mean, I'm just as much into... God, like, you know, like I said, David Sanborn, the piano of Bob James. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. Paul Desmond on horn. I, I actually just was emailing with Randy Brecker. I sent him my favorite pop trumpet solos, you know, because I'm, I'm just really into uh, that, like, checking out jazz guys playing on pop tunes. I mean, all of that stuff. Yeah. What was one of those trumpet solos? Oh, God. I, I sent, um, actually, two of them were his. And then uh, one of them was uh, Chuck Finley on uh, Lost in the Hurrah by uh, Mark Jordan. There were a couple, uh, Michael Franks, uh, When Sly Calls, that's Randy. Um, yeah. And nice. the one from Reminiscing. Oh, uh, yes. I forget who was, I forget who the player was, but uh, great, great stuff. The, uh, that's Little River Band reminiscing the yes. Australian band. Which, which has a brilliant uh, trumpet solo. Yes. At, at, towards the end. I Incredible. Had, I had a great guitar teacher, uh, an Australian guitarist called Dita Kleeman. We, we went through that tune. And he said, um, yeah, they needed to get a trumpet player on this because there was no guitar player who could play over these changes as well. Right, right. And the solo is gorgeous. To me, like, that kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're melodic gems and they're things that stand the test of time, you know. So would you um, notate, transcribe certain lines from, from these instrumentalists? Yeah, I would. I like. I was big on. I still am. I mean, this is stuff I do all the time. If I hear something, a certain sound, um, I love notes in the cracks. I love the chromatic notes and notes like bending into notes that you normally wouldn't bend into, or bending from a note that you normally wouldn't uh, start from. Because okay. a lot of st- a lot of sax players will do bends that are different from what guitar players would do. Or pedal steel guys. Mm-hmm. I love pedal steel guys, you know. And uh, I actually took some lessons with some pedal steel guys uh, back in my college years. And, um, you know, I try to get something from each instrument. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I heard, actually, that on that, again, that solo album, I heard some licks that, that sounded steely, but, but clearly on, yeah. a, on a fretted guitar. That, yeah. So I can yeah, hear that sure. through. Sure. For players who, who have brought up, you know, as just rockers or, or blues players, what's your suggestion? Do you have like any go to records for people wanting to branch out of sort of guitar cliches? Yeah. So I you know, it's they say you are what you eat, you know, it's it, yeah. you are what you listen to, you know, and you can't it's like you can't really play jazz if you don't listen to any jazz. You know, it's you have to really listen to this kind of stuff. And so there's a great record, uh, Blues in the Abstract Truth by Oliver Nelson. And uh, he's bl- they're blending blues and jazz. Freddie Hubbard's on it, Bill Evans. It's beautiful. That's a great record. Um, you know, there's, God, so many. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. I mean, a lot of the Benson records, especially during the CTI years, mm-hmm. where he was, you know, and the, his early work. I was just listening to a record called The Boss by Jimmy Smith, and George has some great blues solos on there. When we get done with this, I'll send you the link, Kevin. Okay. It's, awesome. uh, there's some great blues solos on there. I'm, uh, I'm asking for a friend, as they say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <that> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, I'm so inspired. I just want to go and look up some records and play some guitar right now. And We've only been talking for like 10 minutes or something. <laughs> That's great. That's Very great. Cool. Very cool. You've um, 
you've had a, a great career as a side man as well. So gigs with um, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Dr. John, um, Tony yeah. Braxton, for example. What's yeah. what's so, important as a uh, side man? You know, I never really wanted to be a side man. I sort of, you know, I always want to be an artist. And I got signed pretty early. Yeah. You know, I did some early session work and I met some people at the labels and uh, Steve Backer, who actually signed the Brecker Brothers, he actually came up with a name. Um, he signed me in, I think it was 97. Um, and I had done some side man work. But what happened was, once like the internet sort of came into play, and uh, I noticed like a shift, like instrumentalists weren't getting the budgets to make records anymore. Okay. okay. You know, and the... People weren't buying as much, and I thought, you know, I'd better start doing some other things, you know. And um, I went for a couple of years with Blood, Sweat, and Tears with David Clay and Thomas, 2000, 2001. And then I worked with this guy, David Mann, who was from Tower of Power. He was an incredible horn player. I, and uh, obviously Bobby Caldwell and uh, Diane Schur and, uh, and a lot of others. I'm, and I'm glad I did it, you know. I really it, – it's given me chances to – see where I fit and fit myself in other ways. And it's always a great way to, every melody is a tool for the year, you know, and that's uh, when you're working with a lot of different people. I take something from everybody, you know. How about something more pop like Toni Braxton? Um, I know her, her first records, the Babyface records had some really interesting guitar hooks and things. Quite subtle, but, that's, but tasty. That's... Uh, my buddy Michael Thompson, he's he's on all of that on stuff. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's not me. Uh, yeah, we did a, a couple tracks that were at the Hit Factory, and that was during the Secrets time, and they wound up on the cutting room floor. So that, that, ah. that unfortunately, was my experience. But, uh, you know, um, but a lot of that great work is Michael's. You're a prodigious jammer. I see you inviting guests up on your gigs all the time or you sitting in with other people. What do you love about that? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, you know, I did a, this show, Studio Jams, which um, was on BET. In fact, to date, I'm the most recorded guitarist on that show that they've ever had. And um, to date. And I think it's a good thing. I mean, we there was many great performances you sort of get together with guys and kind of go for it um and i live in new york i mean it's <laughs> i have access to uh, i i do this place iridium downtown and i would have a guest each time i had bernie williams i had oz Noy sit in last time we were there uh, brian charette a great uh, keyboard player so i mean this you know it, it's it's just such a great scene here you know is it true that you can just jump on the subway with your with your uh, gig bag and and roll up at a gig? It is. I don't do it, <laughs> but because again, I'm a half an hour out of the the heat. But um, it's really great. I mean, it's still it's still my favorite place in the world, and I know we're going through tough times. But uh, um, I, I'm hoping everything comes back to normal. You know. You studied at at Berkeley. What what did right. you, what did you take from that? Well, it was a great, see, I, I was only there for a semester because I got a gig. So I left, I was gone for three, four months. And then when I came back, I was already working. You know, I was in this uh, guitar player magazine, had this column spotlight. And I got in there early yeah, on, the which was, I guess, call. 19. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it had, it had some great players and yes. Paul Gilbert and ingve and frank Gambali and and it was kind of a big deal at the time i think it was like october 90 i was in and uh and it's weird i started getting calls from that sometimes people would recognize me just from this little thing wow, in the magazine that's, that's, you know? that's so and uh the times have changed you know but uh, so i really i think the best thing i took from berkeley was that it was such a great melting pot of people from all over with the you know, the drive, you know, and I was shedding at that time, like all day long, I was playing <laughs> all day long, you know, and I mean, I still love to play all the time. I play, I pretty much play all day long now, but then I was really had the regiment thing together then. So, you know. And what, what was your schedule like that, that early nineties? I mean, that was, you know, again, 
uh, getting out of high school, I, I was spending, you know, 12 to 13 hours a day working on stuff. And uh, again, being in New York, having access to like, you know, the best teachers, the best, you know, I get to go and hang out with people. Once I started doing some pro work, I got friendly with a lot of the great cats, mm -hmm. like the guys I grew up listening to. So I pretty much met everybody and I could, you know, it's, I could pick everybody's brain, you know, and, uh, it's, you know, David Sanborn played on my first album. Uh, I actually went to Michael Brecker's house and showed him some sax lines. I fingered for guitar and it became an article in a uh, guitar player magazine. So, I mean, it's just this incredible stuff that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else, uh -huh, you know? Uh -huh. Amazing. Amazing. The, um, yeah. You had a you had a hot Licks video out, and I guess recently yeah. you've got the equivalent, which is a True Fire course. the The hot Licks video, yeah, I, I think, like like guitar players spotlight. If a guitar player also had a hot Licks video, that was a pretty impressive calling card. Yeah, I mean, it's I've had such a strange career because <laughs> I kind of did everything I wanted to do, you know. But then I part of me feels like, well, I still gotta, you know, like. Uh, I really wanted the uh, the Hot Licks video was great. I that's when I was with Blood Sweat and Tears. It was uh, again 2000, and we that's when we shot that. Arlen Roth produced it. Yeah, I okay. can. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was. You know, part of it's on YouTube. You can see some of it on YouTube yep. now. But um, yeah, and then I I was doing a lot of stuff for True Fire. I have four releases for them: uh -huh. uh, in, Inside It Out, New York City, Rhythm and Blues. <clears throat> and then I did a uh, 50 country fried blues licks and I did a whole smooth jazz course too, which is actually doing really well. You know, it's, you never know what's going to take off. You yeah, know? yeah. I guess that's the flip side. So you, you talk about changes in the industry. Um, I guess the flip side is that you can have uh, a bunch of different irons in the fire that have, uh, that you've just recorded and, and they're out there doing their thing. Yes. Right. Yeah, sure. The mailbox money is important. And, you know, and I have a signature guitar that uh, I have a signature guitar line with Reverend, which yeah, is a, yeah. it's a great company, great guitar. And, um, yeah, I think all these things are like a necessity now. And it's funny, like I said before, I didn't want to be a side. I just wanted to be a recording artist, do my records and, and tour during it, doing it. But Doing all the other things now, it's kind of, it, it's sort of this melting pot career that I, it's been enjoyable because I've gotten so many different, to do so many different things, meet so many different people, and uh, it's helped me grow, you know. You're such a, a studied player through your own hard work, and um, have you always had a, a strong work ethic? It sounds like you did from a very young age. Yeah, yeah, that, that I have. I, I don't want to say... Um, I had scholastic aptitude because <laughs> I didn't. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still like intrigued by music. You know, I, I got to say there's always something, you know, I'm always searching for that next chord or that next, you know, <laughs> something, you know. So what are you working on when, when you say you're looking for the next thing? What, what, what do you work on or what do you aim towards? You know, a Taylor guitar sent me a uh, beautiful guitar last year and so i ended up doing some solo guitar arrangements and you know just shooting it's just like in my kitchen i just did these little solo guitar things and i would go and do clinics so i just did one with alex skolnick oh, of yeah, uh yeah. testament you know yeah. alex he's uh, terrific and so we played together t uh, two times and i think there's a there's one clip on youtube but um so it's been fun like i kind of I let the music dictate, like whatever comes in, you know, sometimes I just got called to do a big band thing that we got canceled uh, last Wednesday, but it, it's on for next year. Okay. And uh, it's, it. I mean, the band is incredible. Uh, Rick Braun, Gerald Albright, uh, Andrew New, Eric Marienthal, Randy Brecker. I mean, it's just incredible. Wow. Brian Bromberg on bass. Oh, it's an wow. amazing Fantastic. band. So. Excellent. And is that um, when you get called for it, you're just turning up on the gig? Are you doing arrangements? Yeah. Or do you get involved in arrangements or anything like that? Well, I do with my own band, sure. Of yeah. course, I do a lot of that. Um, and um, and I love to arrange TV show themes. That's another thing okay. I do on the side. But uh, 
with this, I'm just kind of just called in to read this stuff down and play. And um, but it's you know to play with guys like that. I mean, you're playing with the best in the world. Is yeah, you yeah. know, G- given the way you've studied the guitar um, and and you've taught through you know some of the video outlets and and some of those articles for Guitar Player, were you ever tempted yeah. to look into like an an academic outlet? I guess we mentioned Joe at the top of the show. He obviously has uh, worked at GIT and. Uh, Yes. And at St. Paul's? Is, is there anything like that ever crossed your mind? Well, I was at SUNY Purchase here, just outside of uh, Manhattan. I was on three and a half years, I did affiliate faculty, where I was doing um, just some jazz majors, some studio comps guys, and checking out their ensembles. So I did that for a while. Times have changed. Now, you know, you need a lot of degrees and stuff to be considered like a full-time uh professor um but i don't you know i i kind of like doing the stuff in drips and drabs so because i am a performer you know that's what i come from and i like to perform that's my favorite thing but um you know the true fire thing has been great and uh i'm hoping to shoot some stuff on my own and release some stuff on my own next year yeah so you prefer writing on your own schedule i guess and your own Exactly. Of it. Exactly. Yeah. I get that. I get that. Hey, you mentioned Bernie Williams earlier. What an interesting yeah. guy and a career that, that guy's had. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, we're very, very good friends. So um, I met him while he was still playing okay. baseball. Yep. So he was with and the he was kind of New York, uh, the Yankees. The Yankees. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm from Australia, so, and even I know that's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep, it's pretty big. Yeah, so he was coming to see me, and uh, we became like best friends. I mean, it's just been a, it's been a hoot. It's I guess that was probably seventeen years ago or something. And we ended up, I sort of eased him into the music thing. You know, okay. uh, he's mentioned it several times in interviews, and uh, I was so glad to like help him, like kind of facilitate that movement. I mean, he always played, and he's a very gifted guy, uh-huh. but he was kind of shy at coming out. And I was bringing him around, and he was coming and sitting in. And now, I mean, we've played, we played Catano, we played Iridium, we played Infinity Hall. You know, I remember him coming to see me at the Blue Note with I Insure. I mean, it's he's, it's it's great. We've done a lot of cool things together. Uh huh. That's cool. That's very very cool. You mentioned your Reverend guitar. How how long have you been associated with those guys? It's been about. I have 12 years now. I had a signature model. Uh, I have the prototype here. I think it was 2007 or 8. I did this all-star guitar night show, and they were there, and they really loved it. And um, I remember them saying, we want to do a model for you. And I was like, uh-huh. wow, okay, this is terrific. And it's gone through a few different configurations, and I can't let the cat out of the bag, but there's going to be a big one towards the end of this year. Oh, and really? uh, That's cool. Yeah, it's going to be great. I'm really excited. Okay, okay. The um, Up until January of this year, I had never played a Reverend, but a friend of mine was looking to buy one, so we, we went on a bit of a road trip and, and found the biggest dealer in Australia, which was three hours from Sydney. And um, we must have played a dozen Reverends, and sadly there was not a Gil Paris model. Um, oh. I'm sorry, but um, I was okay. I was knocked out by how great those guitars were. Amazing, amazing! Like the, you know, I got to be careful what I say, but they're they're for what they have, their price point, they are killing some of the the bigger name oh, yeah. uh, Gibson yeah, yeah, and Fender yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm I'm honored to be with them. Yeah, cool. The um, their neck. They've. I, I love. Is it? Is Joe Naylor? Is he the 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 guy? He's. Yeah. I, I heard an interview recently. He says, you know, we've we just pinned it down to one neck type, and I thought this yeah. will be interesting. But it was so fun. Like every guitar felt really great. You got used to the neck. Amazing. Mine has not moved, and I've been like using it all the time. So, um, and the you know they have good. They have good players like Greg Cock has a signature model. Rick Vito has a signature uh-huh. model, yeah, yeah. and we'll get together like you know once a year at Nam and all play together, and it's it's like a nice camaraderie. Um, and they're beautiful guitars. I love their guitars too. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there was a Greg Koch. We we did uh Greg Koch. We did play that one. That was that was very cool. The um yeah. Well, if you can't talk about your new new one, the the upcoming one, let's talk about the current model. So that's the the two humbuckers and the single coil in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some video. So it it looks like we're melding with Fishman. So um, that part I can tell you because okay. the the prototype's already kind of out there a little bit, but okay. um, the body and the whole other configuration I won't give away. But yeah, right now. Sure. It's the humbucker and uh, two humbuckers and single. Yeah, nice. You know. Nice. Yeah. Now, I noticed yeah. with your switching, you've got when you get into positions two and four, the humbuckers are still in full humbucking mode. Like a lot of guitars, they'll go to a, a split there. Right. But, you know, it's funny, but it still has the quack. I, you would think it wouldn't, but it, it seemed to just work, you know, and I needed something that was versatile. And, um, with the base contour, you can kind of thin it out a little bit and yeah, really get yeah. that like spank, you know. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So that's very cool. With the base contour, I love that too on all the models I played, even on things like P90s. Um, it sounded great. Yeah. It sounded really cool. I was so surprised because, again, you read the specs, but until there's one in your hands, um, I have a P. I have a P91 here, and I love it. It's uh -huh. like it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love yep. um, another question for a friend, which is me. Um, <laughs> I've got coil splits on, on my... I play Strat-type guitars mostly and with humbuckers and right. singles. And I just like having a switch to flick, you know, the, to split the coil. What I want to know right. is how practical is that bass contour on a gig? Like how, how quickly are, are you dialing that in and out? Well, it is practical. Like, see, what happened was when they first came out with it, the the base contour knob was up where, like, the strap comes. It was up, up about, on the other yeah, part of the bike. Yeah, yeah. That was difficult. And there was no um, – there wasn't, like, a dot marker where you could really eyeball where you were at. Yeah, okay. Now it's, like, you can see it perfectly. There's a nice, clear indentation where, like – so you know where you're at, you know, okay. and if you want to just quickly dial it, it's there, yeah, you know, nice. it's like so much better. Yeah. For, you know. Yeah, cool. For, a, for a, a guy who pulls as beautiful a tone as you do in, in a variety of genres, that's a good uh, endorsement of the, of the model. Thank you. Thank you. What, what else are you using in your rig? So if you've got a, a gig in a club, for example, what are you using amps and, and pedals wise? Yeah, you know, sometimes I have to use the amp du jour, which, uh, <laughs> but luckily for the New York shows, um, yeah. like I used to play at BB Kings a lot. Uh, yeah. The main, they've closed down BBs, and, but um, I can bring like my amps. So I, I have two old Randalls that I run in stereo, which they sound great. They're like 40 years old, but, um, and I have a Klon Centaur pedal, which I'm sure you know is a yeah, rare. Yeah. Um, I use that mostly for recording. Um, and then I have a vintage tube screamer that's, you know, uh, really special. It's very touch sensitive. So, um, you know, mostly the standard fare. I love Boss's stuff. You know, Boss does great stuff. Yeah. I don't really use their overdrive stuff, but, um, I, you know, uh, some of their stuff and the, the Waza, the vibrato is beautiful, you know. Uh-huh. When did yeah. you get your um, clone? Okay, so shout out to Bill Finnegan. When I yes. he sent me one. I mean, he said he just like you know this was back in the day. So I have one of the original ones. I think he was in Boston, and I was signed at the time. So back then, he used to get so much free gear, and uh, I mean, he might have charged me parts or something for it. But uh, uh -huh. he was terrific too. He sent me the little. Uh, adapter where he you know made it out of this little <laughs> it was, he is terrific and that's the thing sounds amazing still yeah. sounds amazing yeah wow that's yeah. very cool very yeah. cool well that's your superannuation right there yeah yeah <laughs> that's those yeah that's that you know <laughs> i can't part with that <laughs> you know hey previous to reverend you were playing a strat had the rose graphic on the on that top bout for a long time tell me about that guitar you know, I haven't, I'm looking at it right now, but I haven't played it in, it's got to be like two, three years. Uh, yeah, you know, it was, 
I had was doing like a smooth jazz thing. The label gave me a, a budget to do a smooth jazz thing, and I said, you know, let me do a romantic vibe. And you know, I had the rose thing, and I, I had a guy. He carved it into the guitar and then painted over it. Oh wow! And and, and it looks beautiful. I mean, he did an amazing job, and um, it ended up being like sort of like a calling card. People ended up asking me about it all the time. You know, yeah, it's you know. It's my second most asked question. The first one is, how old are you? And the second one is, what's with the rose on your guitar? <laughs> I haven't asked how old yeah. you are, but you, you always look the same in any video uh, I've I, seen or promo shot. You look like some guy from 1990 Spotlight or something. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 51, if you must know. Okay. Okay. So you're a late 60s model. I'm, I'm only a couple <laughs> of years behind, so... It's a good, it's a Not good vintage. With CBS, <laughs> yes. <laughs> with CBS, you're right. I like that. I like that. I might use that next time someone asks how old I am. <laughs> you got it. CBS era, yeah, cool. Hey, what's um, what's life like post isolation for you? What's what's coming up? I guess a lot of stuff's postponed or on the back burner, of so, course. Yeah, I mean. You know, Reverend had me going out to Summer Nam, and we were going to actually go back to Wildwood Guitars and shoot again. Greg and I shot about, I think, 15 videos uh, for Wildwood, and you can yeah. check those out. But, yeah, so everything's on the back burner. Uh, all the fest, any festival things that are bigger shows, those all got bumped to, to 2021. And who knows what's going to happen. Um, but... I think the smaller venues, the 100 to 200 seaters, if they if they don't do like maximum capacity, if they do maybe uh, three quarter capacity, I, I think those are going to come back, you know, okay. s yeah. sooner than later. You know, I, we're, we might not see like Coachella or like you know sure. some kind of ridiculous music festival, but uh, that might be a few years out. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I guess the whole thing's so constantly changing. Um, I know in Sydney, yeah. where we are um, in Australia, um, there's a really positive trend of how the numbers are headed. So, um, Great. Great. what that looks like long term, I, I don't know. I don't know, but it, it does seem like there's um, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, and there'll be some music at the end of it for sure. Oh yeah, and you know I. <laughs> I'm definitely going to I'm going to shoot some lesson packs. I have some ideas for some uh, things I was going to do for True Fire, but you know, I think I might shoot a few things here just because travel is so odd right now. Sure. Every time I shot for True Fire, they flew me out to Florida and I would do it there. Oh, okay. But uh, um, you know, and I did a book for Mel Bay, uh, the complete book of double stops and I might do another thing for them because I'm going to be around, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll do a few instructional things. I'll do some writing, try to put some things on the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, that way when things pick back up, you know, I'll be up and running. You know? Yeah, for sure. When you say writing, is that uh, for your own stuff or do you write for other people? Yeah. So I've been working with this singer and, well, we're together. So um, her name's Jessie Lambiazzi and we've been doing stuff for years and she sounds great. It's sort of like a... Tedeschi Trucks vibe, a little maybe a little jazzier times, but we've been playing that stuff in the city a lot, and uh, we've we've got about an EP worth of material, and then um, and I'm still writing uh, original instrumentals. There's just not as much of an audience for the uh, original instrumentals sure. as there used to be. Okay. Um, so I've been arranging some old tunes. I just did a thing with. Uh, a Taste of Honey, Sunshine of Your Love, tunes that people know. So when they come out, it's something they can identify with. You okay, know? yep, yep. And are you, are you reharmonizing those or reworking those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. When you say, you mentioned TV themes earlier, is that the same sort of deal? Are you reinventing those? Yeah. When you arrange I, I love, so, um, and I, some of the guys in my band do that too. So we do a version of Mission Impossible, that Matt King, the keyboard player, uh, reharmed, and um, we do all kinds. And Night Court, Frasier, Sanford and Son. I mean, I could go on and on. And we'll we'll twist the stuff around. Maybe we'll allude to the melody, 
and go into like the Crusaders put it where you want it or something. We'll keep, you know, and I want to keep things fun, but I want to bring people in and have them hear something they remember. You yeah, know, it's yeah, something, yeah. oh, I grew up with that. Oh, wait, wait, what show is this? Yeah, you know, and then yeah. you take them along for the ride. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's fun. Man, record that. Make an album out of that. That would be so fun. You know, Bernie and I were talking about doing a whole record of that because I arranged a bunch for him. We were doing Sex in the City and Frasier and uh, yeah, you know, it, that would really be fun. Um, and we've been talking about, but you know, now everything is so put on hold as far as yeah, like, sure. you know, budgets and everything like that. So I guess we're going to have to see what's going to happen. Sure, sure. Well, Gil, it's been so fun talking to you and finding out about this amazing career. Oh, of- awesome. It's been great sharing it with you. And, you know, guys, come out, you know, check out the YouTubes. I, I have a couple channels and, uh, you know, check out the True Fire courses. And uh, I'll see you back when things start up again. Well, yeah, Gil, thanks so much. It's been inspiring and, and a lot of fun chatting. And uh, I'm going to go transcribe some uh, trumpet lines or something now. Awesome. I'll send you the email. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, there you go. Gil Paris, that was so inspiring. Amazing, amazing. So, uh, yeah, I just want to go and play. So I'm going to wrap up the show really fast. Um, remember to head over to guitarspeakpodcast.com where you can check out our previous episodes. Um, you can subscribe through various podcast networks. You can check out our social media, backing tracks, t-shirts, all that stuff. Make sure you check out Gil's stuff too through his YouTube uh, and, and other sites, the True Fire stuff as well. It looks amazing. And uh, that's about it from me. Thanks for joining me on the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling. I'll catch you next time. Bye now.